I am the Wakai Navis, the recorder of events. Much have I seen and heard, the birth of kings and the passing of dynasties, songs of joy and the screams of multitudes put to the sword, the building of cities and palaces, and their destruction by conquering hordes. was wilderness once. The old fortress built by the Afghans had become the haunt of the flying fox and the owl. At night, jackals and hyenas raised their heads and bayed to the moon. In the year 1048 Hijra of our holy prophet, on whom be peace, corresponding to the year 1638 of the birth of Jesus, on whom also be peace, His Majesty Emperor Shah Jahan, descendant of the house of Cengiz Khan and Tehmur, fifth of the illustrious dynasty of the great Mughals, Babur, Humayun, Akbar and Jahangir, came to Delhi and inspected this site beside the river Jamna. Delhi has been the capital of Hindustan from times beyond the memory of man. It shall again be the seat of the empire of the Mughals. Here we will raise a mighty fort, which will be the envy of our friends and the despair of our foes. <laughs> began to rise. First the battlements, one and a half miles long, over sixty feet in height and octagonal in shape, followed by the royal apartments, the Rang Mahal or the Palace of Colours, the Khwabga, the Dreamland, the Tasbihana or the Prayer Room, Divane Am, the Hall of Public Audience, the Divane Khas, the Hall of Special Audience the hammams or the royal baths. To feed the royal baths, waters of the river Jamna were raised to the citadel to run down the marbled waterways. The canal was named the Stream of Paradise. It fed the baths, ran along the hall of private audience, past the sleeping chambers, to the Rang Mahal, to fall here into a large cistern wherein a fountain shaped like a lotus flower sent a spray bubbling forth from its center.
After nine long years of relentless labor came the day of rejoicing. One day in April 1648, a royal procession entered the fort. Prince Dara Shiko showered coins of silver and gold over the throne. Let a new coin be struck to commemorate the building of this citadel. The fort will be known as Kilai Mualla, the auspicious fort. The peacock throne will be installed in the Devane Khas. Subhanallah. And on the Bhojla Pahar, we shall build the biggest and the most beautiful mosque in the world. Praise be to Allah. Beyond the walls of the fort, a new city began to rise. Members of the royal family and the Umrah built themselves mosques and mansions. The emperor's favorite child, Princess Jahanara Begum, had the main street of the city laid out and named it Chandni Chok. For nine days, the citizens rejoiced over the birth of their city. The city was named Shah Jahanabad after the name of its builder. Before this, six cities of Delhi had been razed and had fallen to ruin. Shah Jahanabad was the seventh city of Delhi. Delhi became the most fabulous city of the Orient. From all parts of the world, people came to see its splendorous sights. To Delhi came Christian missionaries, globetrotters, ministers and ambassadors of distant kingdoms. His Excellency, Janab Francois Bernier, from the Kingdom of France. The Emperor has been gracious enough to invite me to spend the day with him in court. And, bon Dieu, quel spectacle magnifique! What a beautiful spectacle! First, the horses from the royal stables are paraded before the king. They have all kinds. Every conceivable breed. Superb. Now come the elephants. Incroyable. Vraiment étonnant. Truly enormous, like living fortresses. Then, animals from the royal zoo. After the parade of animals, units of the army are put through their paces. Thus passes half the morning. Then the emperor engages himself in more serious business. 
فریاد ہے فریاد ہے شہن شاہ کے در پر فریاد لے کے آئے ہیں جہاں پر ہمیں انصاف چاہیے یہاں سے کوئی کھالی ہاتھ نہیں جاتا Here's all kinds of complaints from the rich and poor, neighbor against neighbor, citizens against the state. Ah, and when the day's business is over, His Majesty relaxes. Oh, the vocal set without. The palace resounds with the tinkling of dancers' bells and all the love songs of courtesans. <laughs> Every Thursday, the gates of the fort were closed, only to men. For that one day, the citadel was given over to women. <laughs> look, 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 there's a man. He's a man. Isn't it? Where? Where? What is he doing? Here. 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 Peering at us like that. Really? The fort was guarded by women, and women took over the stores. Princesses of royal blood and wives and daughters of noblemen came out to make their purchases. The red fort was transformed into a woman's market, the Mina Bazaar. Oh, you, Yasmin. Yeah. 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 Mommy, yeah. I buy anything from your shop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The less said about her, the better. Yes, child, I must buy you something today. Begum Saiba, cast your gracious eyes on my wares. I have muslin from Dhaka, velvet from Iran, lace from China, brocades from Banaras. Here is something fit to adorn the arms of a princess of royal blood. Just look at those bracelets. Hmm. Oh, they are the best. They are studded with diamonds. See them glitter on your beautiful hands. Look at that pair of glass bangles. Aren't they lovely? Especially designed for a princess of taste like yourself. Jahanara Begum. Exquisite. No, my child. A princess of royal blood does not wear glass on her wrist. Please, Amma. I'd love to wear them just for today. Tomorrow I'll give them away to my handmaidens. Your Majesty. <laughs> Why disappoint the princess? Let her indulge herself with these trinkets. They're only a trifle. <laughs> Just a uh, hundred rupees each? A hundred rupees each? Common glass bangles at the price of gold? I do not ask your majesty to pay for the bangles. Oh, no. Please accept them as my humble tribute to the shapeliness of our hands. <laughs> All right, you may have them, Jahanara. Gold coins for glass bangles? May Allah grant you a handsome bridegroom, Jahanara Begum. It was a glorious time in the history of our ancient land. Kala e Muallah became the center of the universe. Its greatness was inscribed in the Divan e Khas in letters of gold. If on earth be an Eden of bliss, it is this, it is this, it is this.
In the autumn of 1657, His Majesty was taken ill. People claimed to have seen the angel of death hovering over the royal apartments. His Majesty's sons lent ear to these evil rumours, and each proclaimed himself King of Hindustan. Brother spilt the blood of brother. The Emperor watched helplessly from his sick bed. Ultimately, Prince Abul Muzaffar Muhammad Moyuddin, third son of His Majesty, triumphed over the others and had himself crowned Shahin Shah Aurangzeb Alamgir. Bada ba mulahiza hoshiyar! Abul Muzaffar, Muhyiddin Muhammad Aurangzeb Alamgir Shahin Shah Hindustan! The fabulous peacock throne awaited its new royal occupant. It was shaped in the form of two dancing peacocks with tails fanned out. Each peacock eye was a glitter with rubies and diamonds. Between the tail spreads of the peacocks was a parakeet cut out of one large emerald. The massive legs of the throne were studded with diamonds and emeralds. And above the throne was a gold-laced canopy. On either side were two human figures made of silk, gold, pearls and other precious stones. This was the first coronation to take place in the Red Fort. First came bands of Shehnai players. Behind them, strings of elephants caparisoned in silver and gold. Gold bells that hung down from their necks and the silver chains round their massive feet clanged as they swayed. Aurangzeb witnessed a display of fireworks on the banks of the Jamna, and people floated paper boats with oil lamps on the stream. Delhi citizens enjoyed the spectacle for one whole week. While Aurangzeb celebrated his ascent to the throne in Delhi, his father, Shah Jahan, was kept a prisoner in Agra. And on the 22nd of January, 1666, Shah Jahan, the greatest builder of all times, the creator of the Taj Mahal, the fort and the mosque of Agra, of forts, palaces, gardens and mosques at Lahore and the holy city of Ajmer, of the great Jama Masjid, the walled city of Shah Jahanabad, and of Kalai Mualla, the auspicious Red Fort of Delhi, died a captive of his son. Aurangzeb made his contribution to the Kalai Mualla by building the most beautiful little place for private worship. This was the Moti Masjid, the Pearl Mosque. Allah. Aurangzeb was a Puritan. He even disliked music. Ha <laughs> 
What impious sound assails our ears? What means this wailing and lamentation? Shadow of God, music is dead. We are carrying its corpse for burial. Bury it deep so that no sound or cry is heard from it again. Aurangzeb was a pious man, in many ways a good man, but also a bigoted man. He departed from the traditions of his great ancestors, Humayu, Akbar and Jahangir, who had treated their subjects, Hindu, Muslim and Sikhs, as equals. His policies yielded a bloody harvest of hate and rebellion. In his later years, Aurangzeb realized that he had sown the seeds of the destruction of the Mughal Empire. Asma, Hama, Fasad, Baki. After me, chaos. I came a stranger to this world, and a stranger I depart. I know nothing of myself what I am, and for what I was destined. My back is bent with weakness, and my feet have lost the power of motion. The breath which rose is gone, and has not left even hope behind. The agonies of death come upon me fast. My vessel is launched upon the waves. Farewell. Farewell. And so did Aurangzeb's 50 years of rule and 90 years of life come to an end. Enmity between father and son, brother and brother, became a tradition of the house of Babur. Kings came and went like puppets in a play, each leaving another black spot on the fair name of the Mughal dynasty. Amongst them, there was one who loved dance and music. Ah, <laughs> Nikab Ahista Ahista Kijum Gulse Nikasta Gulab Ahista Ahista Ba Adab Ba Mulahaza Hosia Abul Fata Muhammad Murizuddin Jahandar Shah Baad Shah Geti Pana Ahista Ahista Jawaab Ahista Ahista Ke Jungul Se Nikasta He also loved a common slut Ahista Ke Jungul Se Nikasta Hai Gulab Ahista Ahista <laughs> ah, the form of an angel, the voice of a nightingale. <laughs> but I am only a slave. I kiss your majesty's feet. Ha, <laughs> Vava! Lalkumar, hereafter you will be known as Begum... Begum Imtiaz Mahal. Marhaba, Subhanallah, your majesty, I... I have to live in the palace then? Mm-hmm. 
How will I see Zora? Who is this Zora? 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 Zora, she's my best friend. She sells watermelons. <laughs> the sweetest watermelons in Delhi. <laughs> Your Majesty must taste them. Mm -hmm. In good time, we shall <laughs> taste them all. We appoint Zohra as the chief lady in waiting. She will also <laughs> live in the palace. <laughs> Thank you, Your Majesty. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Niamat? Niamat? Who is this Niamat now? Niamat Khan, Kalavant, my brother. He plays the sarangi. He is a very clever musician. Hmm. A clever man, is he? Well, the state needs clever men. We appoint him um, governor of Multan. <gasps> Oh, 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 that, that will please him, Your Majesty. You are a most kind and loving monarch. Very loving. My dear Lal, uh, no, 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 um, Imtiaz Mahal. Imtiaz, we are a monarch in love. <laughs> No wonder Hindustan became the dominion of misrule. The seat of the misrule was the divan e khas from where one foolish edict followed another. Ba adab, ba mulahaza, hoshiyar, ala hazrat, abul fath, nasiruddin muhammad shah, baad shah ghazi, shah e shahan, but to the citizens, he was simply Muhammad Shah Rangila, the merry monarch. There was much coming and going of courtesans, and the cup of wine was never empty. <laughs> While these carousals were at their height, a Persian army under Nadir Shah invaded Hindustan. Nadir Shah's army sweep across the land like a hurricane. Huh? Ah, Hanul Delhi Durast. It's a lo long way to Delhi. Jadu Pare Tore Na. Now 
Adi Shah has crossed the Punjab. Huh? Ah, head still a lo long way to Delhi, Hanus. Hanus, Delhi, Dur Az. <laughs> From Delhi. Ah, come, 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 fill the cup. Just one, <laughs> just one more for the royal road. We shall lead our men to victory, to victory. The Persians routed the Indians. The Merry Monarch craved forgiveness and personally escorted Nadir Shah to the capital. The Divan e Khas was especially illuminated in honor of the conqueror. <laughs> It was not to see Indian dancing and hear music that Nadir Shah had come to India. He cleaned up the royal treasury, gouged precious stones out of the marble walls of the palace, stripped the hall of private audience of its silver and gold. The citizens' temper began to rise, and suddenly it burst into flame. A pigeon seller refused to sell his birds to the Persians. Words led to abuse, abuse to blows. The citizens fell on the Persian soldiers they found loitering in the bazaars. Nadir Shah rode out to the city and saw the corpses of his soldiers strewn about the streets. And his rage was terrible. As long as this sword is out of its scabbard, the life of every citizen of this wretched city is forfeit. Spare no one, high or low, young or old, male or female. No one! For three days and nights, the killing continued. I have seen corpses of hundreds, thousands of men, women and children strewn about the city, the streets, the streets are like rivers of blood. What shall we do? What can we do? They say His Majesty has gone to Nadir Shah to plead for peace. Not a soul has been spared by the avenging sword. If it be your wish to carry the work of destruction further, put life back into the corpses and slaughter them and slaughter them again. What that? Please you. The city has paid the penalty it deserved. Let the killing stop. For three months, Nadir Shah stayed in the Red Fort. To load the booty he had collected, it took 1,000 elephants, 7,000 horses, and 10,000 camels. He took the diamond Kohinoor. He took the Peacock Throne.
All that remained was the putrefying corpse of the Mughals, over which clashed the swords of the Afghans and the Marathas. For years, Delhi continued to be looted. Plundering hordes like Ahmad Shah Dalis would swoop down and despoil it beyond recognition. <laughs> remains of a land which has been visited by a plague of locusts not once, not twice, but nine times. Only a howling wilderness, a no man's land to be despoiled by every newcomer. The poet Mir Takimir bemoaned the fate of Delhi. I am one of the unfortunate inhabitants of this wretched city. Where there was the peacock throne, we now have a wooden platform painted over with garish flowers. <laughs> Princes whose ancestors filled poets' aprons with pearls have to stuff their ears against the wailing of their hungry kinswomen. Emperor Shah Alam, the dust of whose feet was antimony for the eyes of his subjects, has been blinded by the Rohila brigand Ghulam Qadir. What was once a garden lush and green is wilderness. Not a withered flower is seen. Hands that held the scepter ruled a vast domain are stretched for arms but are stretched in vain. In this way, days passed into months and months into years. One king came on the scene and as quickly passed away. The empire of the Mughals shrunk to the four walls of the Red Fort. One day, two washermen at the banks of the Jamna started fighting with each other and came to the Red Fort to plead for justice. When they were taken to the presence of the emperor, he said, Oh, oh. Tell the washerman my empire does not extend to the banks of the river. <sighs> Tell them. Real power had passed into the hands of the Marathas, whose writ now extended from Bengal in the east, across Delhi to Mysore in the south. Then the Marathas fell out with each other, and power passed into the hands of the English. The imperial bodyguard posted in the fort came under the command of English officers. The last man to wear the Mughal crown was the poet king Bahadur Shah Zafar. At the age of 62, he took over the administration of the ruins of the Mughal empire. For the last time, the walls of the red fort echoed with the cries of the heralds. Ba Adab! Ba Mulahaza! Hoshya! Bahadur Shah had neither wealth nor territory, but that did not prevent him from being the king patron of poets whose names glitter like diamonds. Just as a dying flame splutters brighter for a brief moment before it flickers out, so it was with the Mughal Empire. It was in the early hours of the morning of the 11th of May, 1857. What 
is the cause of this tumor. We have killed the white foreigner in Mirat. We will destroy the usurpers of the Mughal throne. We will drive the Firangi into the sea. La Hulla, Allah protect us. What kind of talk is this? Bacher Salamat! Open the gate! Let us in! We will rid you of your enemies! We will make you emperor of Hindustan! We must have time to consider this matter. And I, as the queen your wife, say that time for consideration is over. Brothers, the gate beneath the harem has been unlocked! Bahadur Shah, who was still in two minds, was forced to become the emperor of Hindustan. Rebellion spread across the land like wildfire. Brave young men came up to fight. In Bengal, there was Mangal Pandey. In Avad, Malika Hazrat Mahal. In Bihar, Kumar Singh and Amar Singh. In Kanpur, there was Nana Sahib Peshwa, Tantia Tope and Azimullah. And in Jhansi, there was Rani Lakshmi Bai. In Faizabad, Malvi Ahmadullah. At Delhi, Subedar Bakht Khan, took over the command of the rebellion. Delhi had become the center of the battle for freedom and the red fort its citadel. Many bloody battles took place between Indians and the English. They waged for many months. Disunity and disaffection amongst the Indians resulted in their defeat and victory for the English. On the 20th of September, 1857, the royal family was compelled to flee. A British regiment marched into the Red Fort. On the 27th of January, 1858, the last emperor of Hindustan was brought to the hall of private audience as a prisoner. The same hall where his forefathers had sat upon the bejeweled peacock throne. After being kept waiting for an hour and a half, the emperor was produced before the military tribunal. On the 9th of March, 1858, he heard the sentence... The court is of the opinion that on the evidence presented before it, prisoner Bahadur Shah Zafar has been proved guilty of all charges laid against him and therefore sentences him to imprisonment for life. On the 6th of November, 1858, Bahadur Shah was taken to Calcutta and from Calcutta sent on to Rangoon. And so the great dynasty of Babur, Akbar and Shah Jahan came to an end. By the time the 19th century came to a close, the spirit of rebellion had spread across the land. At the beginning of this century, 
Bankim Chandra Chatterjee of Bengal sang India's first song of freedom. Mande Mataram Sujalam Supalam South, people were singing the songs of freedom composed by Vallathol. Muhammad Iqbal of the Punjab also raised his voice in fervent praise of his country. First 20 years of the present century were not yet over when a new light erupted from the heart of India. This was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Along with Mahatma Gandhi rose millions of others and our fight for freedom entered a new phase. Mahatma Gandhi's voice beckoned these people onward. <laughs> We may belong to any religion, but we belong to India. And if we all fight together, no power can keep us under subjugation. Masses of India joined the struggle for freedom. The British Empire began to totter to its fall. In the autumn of 1939 began the Second World War. India was dragged into it. Our leaders protested, but their protests were in vain. At last, on the 9th of August 1942, Gandhiji said in clear terms what had been in the hearts of all Indians. He told the British, quit India. At this very time, from the shores of India, Indian soldiers captured by the Japanese banded themselves together to form an army of liberation. Its commander was Subhash Chandra Bose. Friends, independence admits of no compromise. Freedom has only one connotation, namely that the British and their allies must quit India for good. And those who really want liberty must fight for it and pay for it with their own blood. We must march forward and forward till victory is achieved and freedom won. Inkalab Zindabad, Azad in Zindabad. the Indian National Army marched up to our eastern frontiers.
60,000 soldiers of the Indian National Army fell prisoner to the English. Amongst them were three officers, a Hindu, a Muslim and a Sikh. All three were locked up in a cell in this fort. On the 5th of November 1945, the three officers were brought up for court-martial before a court consisting of seven British officers. The defence was conducted by a team of eminent lawyers consisting of Mr. Bhulabai Desai, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and others. After the prosecution had finished its case, the accused made their statements. Captain Shah Nawaz was the first to address the court. The question before me, was the king of the country. I decided to be loyal to my country and took a pledge to sacrifice my everything for her sake, my home, my family and its traditions. Captain Sagal, do you wish to say anything in your defense? Yes, sir. I deny being guilty of any of the offenses with which I have been charged. Every one of us has a satisfaction that the Indian National Army fully accomplished its objectives. It protected Indian life, property and honor in Malaya, Burma and other parts of Southeast Asia against all aggressors. Lieutenant Gerbak Singh Dillon, do you wish to say anything in your defense? Yes, sir. I was in the Indian Military Academy, Dehradun. I read, written in block letters of gold, the honor, welfare and safety of your country come first, always and every time. It was with this motto in front of me that I served my country as an officer in the Indian Army. Very well, sir. The court has carefully considered the evidence produced and the statements made by you. It has come to the conclusion that all three of you are guilty of the charges of waging war against the king. We therefore sentence all three of you to transportation for life. The sentence was later set aside, but the three officers were dismissed from the army. The freedom movement continued to gather momentum. It was said that the sun would never set on the British Empire. Now it did begin to set. A few months later came the general elections and the nationalists won a spectacular victory at the polls. The British realized their days were over. On the 15th of August 1947, the government of Hindustan came into the hands of the Indians. The first Prime Minister of Independent India, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, came to the Red Fort. From all parts of our land, hundreds and thousands of men and women came to see their beloved leader and hear his words. His message was broadcast to all the world. Fellow countrymen, it has been my privilege to serve India and the cause of India's freedom for many years. Today, I address you for the first time officially as the first servant of the Indian people, pledged to their service and their betterment. I am here because you willed it so, and I remain here so long as you choose to honor me with your confidence. We are a free and sovereign people today, and we have rid ourselves of the burden of the past. We look at the world with clear and friendly eyes and at the future with faith and confidence.
जय जय मन अभिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा गाविर उत्कल बंगा बिंद हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्छल जल धितरंग तब शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गन मंगल गायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता 